Okay, Tim LaHaye needs no introduction. He has just come out with a new book, Target Israel, and uh, we're all realizing that the whole world is beginning to turn against Israel except for uh, Bible-believing Christians. Even many in the Christian community are uh, moving away from their support for Israel, and that's why we think it's very important to talk about this issue at this time. So, Tim, let her rip tater chip. Okay. Thank you, Tom. I can't tell you what a thrill it is to see so many of you who love Jesus Christ, worship the Lord God Almighty, and are here because you want to use the Word of God that gives a fork glimpse of what's coming to pass. The only people in the world that know what's coming to pass are those who study the Bible. And I, I want to say how thrilling it is to see so many pastors, Bible teachers, and those that are here because they want to find some tools to communicate the most powerful message in the Bible. And that is, God has a plan for mankind's future. And he has demonstrated that plan in his son, Jesus Christ. I have long been a, an advocate of Bible prophecy and evidences for Christianity. In fact, I got a little confession to make to some of you. I, I've been a pastor for 37 years, and I love the church, but I'll tell you that, that uh, since we were led of God to turn our church over to David Jeremiah, which was one of the smartest things I ever did, but uh, God has blessed that church, and that church is built on Bible prophecy. In fact, we didn't plan it this way, but God laid it on my heart to recommend David. I knew him for a number of years before, saw that God's hand was on his life. And so I recommended him to the church and he's been there 34 years. Next year, between the two of us, we will have pastored that church for 60 years. One to two pastors in 60 years. That's because we, neither one of us could find employment anywhere else. <laughs> but the one thing that we had in common is that, and we didn't know this when we started out this journey together, but in those 60 years between the two of us, we have preached through the book of Revelation four times. He did it twice and I did it twice. And so those who say that Oh, I don't think uh, people are interested in Bible prophecy. I don't know what they're smoking because that isn't true. <laughs> that people are interested in prophecy and strangely enough, there's a, a, a interest in the Word of God because there's no other place you can go to find out what's going to happen in the future. And what we are dedicating this session to, and I hope you'll carry it on from from our heart to the hearts of your people. And that is, we are living in the time of the target is Israel, the whole world, even America. And I'd like to make one thing clear before I, I'm kind of like the preacher that got up one Sunday morning and he said, <clears throat> before I preach this morning, I'd like to say something. <laughs> I thought you preacher would get that. Um, anyway, the message that we want to communicate is that God has a plan for mankind and it's laid out in the Bible. And Israel is an, an integral part of that plan. The my mysteries of Israel are incredible. How it was started about 4,000 years ago. 
and under all kinds of persecution and all kinds of animosity and all kinds of obstructions and hatred. I don't know any nation or any people that have been hated more than the children of Israel. And yet after 4,000 years, they still exist. Well, why? How do we know that they still exist? Well, they're in the world today and they're the biggest problem that the enemies of God see today. And the target today is on Israel. And what I'd like to do is give an introduction to Dr. Heinsohn's message and then turn it over to Tom to preach his message. Uh, because Dr. Heinsohn couldn't be here. And, well, by the way, isn't that a beautiful cover for a book? I know those of you in the back may not be able to see it, but we want all of you to have a copy of that book. I think we, the publishers, are making it available for you because they want to recognize that Israel is under attack. And I think all of you who are students of the Bible know that our government today is not in favor of protecting Israel. And I'll tell you, as a former serviceman in World War II, I volunteered for the service because I love this country and recognize that God has put his hand on this. Why is America so unique? Now we say because of the Judeo-Christian principles upon which it's founded. But the truth is, in addition to that is, we have been better to Israel than any nation in the history of the world. And God said, he would bless those that bless Israel and curse those that curse Israel. And my great fear for our country, which I love and I'm sure you do too, is that, well, I'll say the, the people in Washington, and I'm being very commercial, very polite. Uh, I have other thoughts in mind, but these people that seem to think that they know the best thing that they can do, they don't appreciate the greatness of America and that it is because of God keeping his promise because we have been so good to Israel. And my concern for our nation is that we will always continue to recognize that they are the chosen people and not only chosen to send the Messiah, but also to bring about world evangelism. And I think we're on the thrust of that. If you have your Bible, turn with me to a passage that I'd like to use and the introduction is Matthew 24. When it comes to Bible prophecy, the, bi the book is filled with them. As Dr. Walvoord used to say, that uh, the, the Bible is filled with prophecy, 28% of this book. Now, there are many things in the Bible, the history, of course, and the, and the plan of God, and the, or, or the, the things that have happened in the past that we have no other record of. But God has given us the Word of God to straighten out our past, our present, and our future. And I'd like for you to turn with me, if you have your Bible. If you don't have it, you're in trouble in this place. Um, <clears throat> but in Matthew 24, I have come to the conclusion, uh, you can argue with me, but I think this is the greatest chapter on prophecy in the entire Bible, Matthew 24 because it came from the greatest teacher who knew not only the past, but he knew the future, and he outlined it for us. And so I'd like to read quickly to get to the verse that I want to call your attention to. And in Matthew 24, verse 1, it says, When Jesus went out of the, and departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple, Jesus said to them, do you not see all these things? And as you know, it's a Herodian temple and it was in a magnificent structure. Some even thought it was one of the seven wonders of the world. And Jesus said, do you not see these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Now notice, Jesus gave a mini prophecy before he gave the major prophecy that we haven't even touched on yet. But he was saying to the disciples, these marvelous buildings are gonna be destroyed. And as you know, 40 years later, they were. 
And it's a historical fact. How did Jesus know that when he was 33 years of age? Because he was God. He knew the end from the beginning. And he could communicate it to us, which he did. And the disciples then said to him, well, when shall these things be? And I love the way they ask these questions because they're it's almost like all of us are sitting there as the disciples and we ask the same question. He said, now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him saying, tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Now, notice the three questions that he asked. When will these things be? Are you interested in that? What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And notice how he merged the end of the age and his, the sign of his coming, because he realized that he was going to come back and that would trigger the unfolding of God's prophetic plan for the future. Jesus answered and said to them, take heed that no one deceive you. It is so important in the study of Bible prophecy, and that's why I'm so grateful that you've come to this conference. This is the 24th time we've had this conference, and it's grown continually. And I thank all of the speakers that have been here and shared their insights from God's Word. And you can take this message and give it out at home. In fact, you can either give credit for it or just ignore it. Just use it. That's the thing that we're interested in. For many will come in my name, Jesus said, saying, I am the Christ, and will be, deceive many. I won't bore you with the long history of this, of how many false uh, Christs have come on the scene and given false teachings. For many will come in my name, saying this. And verse six, you'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. You know, a good sermon for you pastors to preach is, is how many times when Jesus is giving his unfolding events in, in forgulance in advance, he also said, let not your heart be troubled. Don't be upset. We have seen terrorism come to America. Everyone here in this room knows that. And the FBI is finally recognizing it, if, if you've noticed the recent reports. But the, this kind of terrorism can cause people What's going to happen in the future? Well, we don't have to worry about the future because he holds the future. And don't let your heart be troubled, but keep on doing the thing that you are doing in winning people to Christ and founding them and finding a, a foot for, a foundation for them in the, the uh, principles of the word of God. And now he says in verse seven, for nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. I'm sure you pastors have all preached on this. It's a miracle of what's happened in history, just exactly as Jesus said. But let not your heart be troubled, and don't let your people be troubled by sharing with them that God is in control, even when the world is out of control. All these things, he said, are the beginning of sorrows. And look at verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then will the end come. One of the fun things about growing old in the ministry is you see so many signs fulfilled. You see so many things that happen. And I would like to inspire you to share your faith with your people, and whether it's in seminary or, or college or in the Church of Christ, share the, the principles that they don't have to be afraid. We can recognize what's going on, and it come to, could come to our door. But remember, God is in control, even when things seem out of control. And in this 14th verse, he said, the sign of the end time will be when the gospel of the kingdom is preached in all the world. I've lived so long, I've seen so many incredible things happen. Could I just share with you a little story about a great man? When I was a young pastor right out of Bible college, I began preaching, and I forget how old I was, I was very wet behind the ears, 
And the good thing about it is the people knew it and loved me anyway. Back in Minnesota, where I learned how to shovel snow, and uh, you might you say, why did you end up in California? I prayed. <laughs> While I was shoveling snow, in, can you believe this? For the 25th time, the sidewalk between the parsonage and the church, uh, I was shoveling it for the 25th time that year. I'm a cleric personality, if you can't have any guess that. And uh, the clerics hate to do the same thing twice. You do something and then you get on to something else. But uh, here I am shoveling snow and I looked up at the sky and I said, Lord, isn't there a warmer place you could use my service? I mean, I, I love preaching and so on, but uh, and in five months, I was in San Diego, California. I spent 25 years in active ministry there and I've been traveling ever since. But the, the point I'm trying to make is that God is faithful. And as you look to him and get, ask him for leadership, do what God tells you to do and he will bless your future. Well, all of this to say, and I don't want to take too much from, from Tommy's time because he's got to preach Ed Heinsohn's message in a few minutes. The reason he is going to do that is because Ed sent him the vi video graphics, and I didn't bring any. I just, I'm on my own. But uh, in verse 21, for then there shall be great tribulation. Oh, wait a minute, I'm just speaking of, oh yeah. For then there shall be great tribulation such as not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. And as you know, the great tribulation is yet to come. But as you read down through this e series of events, it's amazing how it reads like the days of our history. But I want to call special attention to verse 29 immediately after the tribulation of those days. So that pinpoints it. Now, if you don't know where, the, this, where this is, in the book, when you get this, uh, I don't have any graphics to give you, but I could tell you that uh, in the book, on page 60, is a chart of the Olivet Discourse. So you can get it all right there. And immediately after the tribulation of those doors, days, the sun will be st turned darkness and the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. And as you know, that's the glorious appearing of Jesus. Then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of trumpet, the resurrection, as you know, is here. But now look at verse 32. Now he said, after outlining all of these prophetic events, learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. I have a black thumb. I can kill almost any plant that grows. It's just part of my gifts. I don't know if I spit on them and it dries, that's where I get used to my anger or something. But I, I do know that I'm not uh, good at horticulture. Some people have the gift, they just you know can grow anything. Well, may I suggest that uh, we bought a, a whole farm in San Diego when we felt led of the Lord to move back there seven years ago next month. And we live in a wonderful house. In fact, I prayed for the leading of the Spirit of God that he would give me some indication this was the place. When I saw the place, I fell in love with it. I knew it needed a little help, and I would try to give it and uh, take care of it. But uh, what really clinched it for me was when I walked in and I saw this nice home that was built for an invalid. I never knew that two years later, my wife would become an invalid, and maybe for the rest of her life. and we inherited this house that was made for an invalid. But the, the thing that gave it me the confirmation in advance, I prayed, Lord, just give me a, an indication from you that this is the house you want us to live in. <clears throat> and then I saw their bookshelf. So I walked over and I looked at the bookshelf 
and I counted 15 of my books there. <laughs> that kind of was God saying, Tim, this is where I want you to spend the rest of your life. And so I've often said, we're on our way to heaven from this place. And after that, who cares? <laughs> I say all of this to say that this next verse is the one I really want you to see. Learn the parable of the fig tree. The fig tree, when used symbolically, communicates God's plan for the future. Remember how oftentimes he would take time to, to take figs from a fig tree that was alive and commend it? Or when he saw it drying up, he would uh, pronounce a curse on it because it was dead. The fig tree in the Old Testament. I know there's a verse in the scripture that says, but when you see the fig tree begin to blossom, or all the trees, well, it, there's other trees. It's not just the fig tree that blossoms in, in the spring, but it says it's near, even at the door. And I would call your attention to the fact that we can confidently say the, it, the nation of Israel is a stellar sign to us in the days in which we live that it won't be long now. This coming of the Lord draws nigh. And it's time for us to take advantage of this fantastic book, the Word of God, and teach it. In fact, there are three times in the Old Testament that the prophets used Israel as a symbol. Uh, it's one 700 years before Jesus was born. Israel was a symbol that God was dealing with mankind. And so it goes all through the scripture. May I suggest that the word of God is quick and sharper than any two-edged sword. And you can take it and preach it and teach it to the people. My uncle was a minister of the gospel. In fact, he led my parents to Jesus. He called in their home and uh, saw them pray to receive Christ. He was there in the First Baptist Church of Farmington, Michigan. It's kind of a war zone right now. They're trying to come back in the Detroit area where we were born. But my uncle was a Bible teacher, and he went to heaven preaching the Word of God. In fact, when he was 75, he was driving to a little country church in Illinois that didn't have a pastor. He was going to be the in interim pastor for as long as he could live. I think that's, that's a great way to be absent from the body and present with the Lord after many years of faithful service. And that's what God is counting on us to, to be, faithful in communicating this book. And you can look at Israel and know that God has a plan for Israel. But so does the left in our country. They have a plan. They want to exterminate Israel. We need to pray that God will, will work in the hearts of our congressmen. I happen to be an optimist about America. I know we're not very popular, but I am. as I look at the world scene, I see signs that maybe Americans are waking up. And we Christians have to be careful to be sure and urge other Christians to register for voting, to get out the vote and vote uh, and become informed so that they vote properly and trust the Lord to give America one more chance. Why should we ask for one more chance? Not just so we can live in peace, but so that we can preach the gospel to every creature. God bless you as you look forward to the future because the truth that we have in the Word of God is the truth that lasts forever. And uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Ice and just say that he has been a wonderful partner in this ministry, studying Bible prophecy that glorifies Jesus Christ. And Ed Heinsohn uh, wanted me to just kind of go through his presentation. It's his presentation, uh, so I don't know all the words that he had planned to say that are not on the 
thing. So we'll just go through that. And after I speak, Dave Reagan is going to come, and he's going to uh, give a critique of the video that's out there called Left Behind or Led Astray. And I appreciate him contacting me. We were going to do it on Tuesday night, but I think we'll have an opening here during this hour to do it, and it would be better rather than uh, cramming it in on Tuesday night. So uh, we'll proceed along those lines. That's what I mean by more transitions. But as you know, uh, increasingly the world is uh, targeting Israel more and more. And when you look at what's going on and the mentality behind the targeting, it's absolutely irrational. It makes no sense other than the fact that Israel is God's chosen people through whom he is going to advance history toward his second coming. And uh, when you realize that you know, God cannot, will not set up his kingdom uh, apart from a revival and conversion of the nation of Israel, and uh, when you consider that God's plan runs through Israel, he has plans that impact us all as a whole, uh, then what you're seeing is the world increasingly becoming epistemologically self-conscious, in other words, aware of what they're doing and more consistent in their opposition to God at every point. And this shows up geopolitically in their opposition to uh, the nation of Israel. And uh, I always like to use the illustration, obviously Satan cannot defeat God in a direct conflict, and so what does he do? Well, if you've seen any of the Arnold Schwarzenegger movies, uh, you know that the former governor of California, uh, nobody could beat him up. And so what did they do in one movie? They went after the wife and kids, right? And so this is what Satan does. He attacks Israel and the church as well. We're involved in this. And you're seeing at the same time that you have a decline in uh, Israel, uh, support for Israel among evangelicals, you're also seeing an de overall decline in America of, of biblical Christianity in many ways. And so, uh, as Ed says, here is the biblical position in Zechariah 2.8. For this is what the Lord Almighty says, whoever touches you touches the apple of his eye. And the apple of the eye not just is referring to the pupil in a person's eye, but uh, it also has a a metaphorical concept as well. You know, if I say my wife is the apple of my eye, I'm saying she's the most important person to me. And the idea here of touching or poking your finger in someone's eye and impacting the apple of the eye uh, is a provocation. And this is what God is saying, that whoever touches you, Israel, touches the apple of his eye. You're poking your finger in God's eyes. And some people might say, well, that's, that's the Old Testament. Well, yes, it is the Old Testament, but the Old Testament is 80% of the Bible, and there's nothing in the New Testament that contradicts or teaches that the church somehow has replaced Israel or any of these other things as well. And so you get these unbiblical responses that are going on today. For example, here's Francis Piper, who was a Lutheran theologian, said one of the most deplorable consequences of World War II was the promise of the Allies to give Palestine to the Jews. Well, I, I think he's a little off here. That happened after World War I. Uh, with, as we learned a couple of years ago, when Jacques got the air, was here and showed us that the San Remo Conference in April of 1920 was when the League of Nations uh, made a treaty promising the land of Israel to the Jews, a homeland for the Jews. And uh, so uh, this guy doesn't even get his facts straight. World War II, as far as agreements and things, had nothing to do with Israel. It did create, because of the Holocaust, uh, period of sympathy, temporary period, uh, in the world that did have a role in Israel becoming a nation, but it wasn't that basis. And here's Alberta Peters, who, a reformed guy from a previous generation, says, it is God's will that there should no longer be any Jewish people in the world. 
Boy, that is just a crazy statement. So 103 times in the Old Testament, God says he's the God of Israel. Did he cease being the God of Israel when the New Testament came along? I don't know anything that teaches that. And he goes on and says, yet, yeah, here they are. So, I mean, this reformed guy who believes in the sovereignty of God, here are a group of people who are somehow uh, forcing God's hand. You know, these people believe in the absolute sovereignty of God, as I do, by the way. And uh, they, they, they're saying that these people, God didn't want Israel to be a nation anymore, but they're still around? Come on. It's not very consistent with his own theology. Yet, here they are. That is a sad fact brought about by their wicked rebellion against God. Look, Israel, in one sense, is a type of humanity. If God had chosen Texas as his, uh, you know, elect people, Texans would have been just as rebellious, if not more so, but at least with a southern draw, than uh, the Jewish people have. Israel, when, when fallen sinful humanity is left to itself, then we're all just as rebellious and depraved as the Jews have been. But this is the whole point of history. If you read the entire story in the Old Testament as well as the New, Israel is going to be saved one day in the future. God is going to sovereignly pour out His Spirit in the New Covenant uh, through the events of the Tribulation and He's going to save His people. His people are going to evangelize the world during the Tribulation. The 144,000 people a Jewish people will be the instrument through which God will use to uh, evangelize the world, which will result in hundreds of millions of people coming to faith in Jesus Christ. They will become a light to the nations. And, uh, but God ends up being the hero of history. Jesus Christ is the hero of history because he will sovereignly move on the nation of Israel in this way. Uh, and their wicked rebellion will come to an end at one point. And we are no different, us Gentiles. And as Romans 11 teaches, if we disobey, he'll remove our branches. And he can graft the Jewish people back in. And that's stated suppositionally, but as you read Romans 11, it becomes indicatival. In other words, it shifts to it is going to happen that way, and we know that's what's going to happen. And here he, uh, Ed quotes Lorraine Bettner, the famous post-millennialist uh, Presbyterian, says, Judaism should have disappeared. Its continued existence as the economy of the Christian church after AD 70 was sinful. And once again, I mean, these are reformed people. Uh, you know, is God so weak that he, if uh, he, where does the Bible say that? And, and Judaism, what does that mean? I mean, they're just like we use the word Christian. There are false versions of Christianity, Roman Catholic Church being one classic illustration, and there are true Christians, you know. And, you know, there's false Judaism. And, uh, but they are going to, as the book of Daniel in chapter 12 says, they're going to wake up during the tribulation and the nation is going to be converted. And here we see Colin Chapman. I've heard him, uh, a Brit, British guy, he has this real weak voice, you know what I mean? And uh, he says, there are no literal promises for the nation and people of Israel. No literal promises. Yet every prophet except Jonah talks about a future time of restoration, belief, and blessing for the nation of Israel, which no one would claim has already occurred. Unless you believe in the fairy tale called the, you know, where the church replaces Israel and somehow they get all the blessings and Israel gets the curses. They take the curses literally for the nation of Israel, but somehow uh, they only read part of the book of Hosea that talks about, uh, you know, her being a prostitute, but they never read about the part or seem to even bring it up or discuss the part where the Lord woos her back. And by the way, 
Who would want a wife named Gomer? <laughs> well, Sergeant Carter, you know, I mean, <clears throat> but. So the fact that Israel is back in the promised land today is no more than a coincidence of history. I mean, this is amazing for people who are coming out of the Reformed faith. It's just amazing. But that's the point. Uh, whether it's in the secular world or in, in the replacement theology of the religious world, they have to treat Israel abnormally for, than God, any other thing. You know, I mean, uh, we hear these people talk about how, uh, you know, a, 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 sand, a, a grain of sand cannot shift its position without God's will, you know, involved in that, but yet the people of Israel can, uh, in their disobedience, outmaneuver God in these situations. It's just amazing. And then you have Islamic extremism. Uh, we see this, it, they're, they're, what unites these people is their hatred for Israel. The shooter at San Bernardino, his father said, was driven by his hatred for Israel. And there was a Messianic Jew uh, at his work, and they had had a, a discussion about Israel. And he told him, apparently, in this discussion two weeks ago, before the, or two weeks before the shooting, that he would never get to see Israel. And this could be why he chose that evil Christmas party as, his, as their target, you know, to go and shoot up the place is because uh, they were celebrating Christmas which is an abomination to these Muslims. Hey, the Puritans didn't like Christmas either. So uh, maybe there's something in common there. Uh, do you know Christmas was outlawed in colonial America? Uh, in fact, you could be put in the stocks for celebrating, you know, wearing bright clothing and being joyous during the season of Christmas. They didn't like Easter either because they were Puritans. Puritan doesn't have to do with sex. It had to do with purifying themselves from the Catholic Church, and they saw these as Catholic celebrations that had corrupted the Bible, but that's a whole other story. Uh, and so he, when, right before he shot uh, this Messianic Jewish believer there in San Bernardino last week, he uh, said, you'll never see Israel. Well, he doesn't realize this guy's going to be in the New Jerusalem forever. I mean, goodness gracious. And... He's going to be real surprised when he gets when he when he and his wife got down there and found out it was 72 Virginians, not 72 virgins. <laughs> you know, uh, down there. And what do the women get? Nothing. They asked this to a lady on Fox the other day, and she couldn't answer it. Apparently, the women jihadists uh, have nothing. You know, uh, but. Nevertheless, the army of Iran can by itself destroy Israel. Well, great, get at it. And isn't that what Gog and Magog is going to be about? Russia, I just can't imagine looking at current events that Russia would be interested in invading the Middle East, can you? <laughs> Tongue in cheek there. Uh, or even Russia aligning with Persia. They've never done that before in history. Oh, wait a minute. They've been doing it in the last few years. Oh, okay. Well, they're getting closer. In fact, uh, I got a little thing during the night when I turned on my phone, I get these pushes from uh, Jerusalem Post, and they said, Israel warned the Iranian Air Force if they fly near the Israeli border, something could happen. You know, I wonder what that might be. But nevertheless, Iran, is, I think they're ranked like the number 23 most powerful military in the world or something, but uh, they are behind all this terrorism and they, you know, what makes them happy is to hate Israel and to destroy the Jews. And so this is one of their big time generals that says that here is, I can't pronounce these guys' names, that's why it's up there for you to look at, some Ayatollah. And he says, the enemies are talking about the options they have on the table. They should know that the first option on 
our table is the annihilation of Israel. Well, great. That's why Gog and Magog is probably going to take place after the rapture, but before the tribulation. In that interval. Uh, and God is going to put hooks in their jaw. Israel discovered oil this year on the Golan Heights. They say it's seven layers deep. And us Texans know that usually there's only one layer of oil. Seven, one for each dispensation, I don't know. <laughs> but nevertheless, they, I can see, and Russia wanted to develop the Leviathan oil field that hasn't been developed yet. And uh, out, in the, out in the Mediterranean that Israel discovered, and uh, Netanyahu turned them down. He doesn't want the Russians to do this. And I can see them trying to become a great uh, regional uh, energy empire, bigger than Saudi Arabia or any of these other Arabs, by taking over the, wanting to take over those oil fields and, and their gas fields and things like this that all of a sudden Israel has after years of not having any oil. Um, so you people from the other states know what it's like to not have oil in your state, but we know down here what it's like. And uh, so you see this kind of talk. Here's another one. Boy, I can't pronounce his name, that's for sure. And it says the Zionist regime will soon be destroyed and this generation will be witness to its destruction. How many of y'all think that's gonna happen? It ain't gonna happen. I mean, that's what Ezekiel 38 and 39 is all about. The IDF is not going to save them. It's God. See, the, the scriptures depicts in the book of Ezekiel uh, when Israel became disobedient, he sent them into the dispersion that God turned his back or face rather away from the nation of Israel. In other words, he was mad. He was angry. He was upset. And you see this in Deuteronomy chapter 30 where he predicted that he would turn his face away from Israel. That's why in, Deuteron in uh, Ezekiel 39 he says when the events of Ezekiel 38 and 39 occur, he will turn his face back toward Israel. I mean, he's going to deal with them. He's going to protect them supernaturally, you see. And that, will, that is associated or connected with the battle of Gog and Magog, and that whole, all of those passages there at the end of the book of Ezekiel. See, in chapter 34, you have the shift from past prophecies to future prophecies, even though there's a few future prophecies in the first 34 chapters of Ezekiel. And once his wife dies and he hears that Jerusalem uh, was captured by the Babylonians, then he totally turns his future his, his prophecy to the future in, in the book of Ezekiel. And that is going to occur where God is going to, <clears throat> in association with the tribulation, I think, he's going to uh, deal kindly with the nation of Israel. He's going to woo them back. He's going to win them to himself. And we see another Iranian says the destruction of Israel is the idea of the Islamic revolution in Iran. I agree. This is what has caused the revival of Islam is the reestablishment of the state of Israel. That has led to a quote revival, I guess the satanic spirits at work here, a satanic revival here of Islam was their reaction to Israel becoming a nation again. And Satan, of course, doesn't want that. He wants to take over the world. And by the way, just a little parenthetical statement here, we've learned in the last seven years in the United States kind of what it's like uh, to have someone who has the character qualities of the Antichrist uh, be our leader. I'm not saying we have persecution or anything yet, but the mentality that is going to come out of the Antichrist is, is on display in the United States now uh, and throughout the world in most of these. I think there's a million people in history that could have been the Antichrist, frankly. Any tyrant, they all have that, those same qualities. But we're getting a pre-rapture taste of what it's like here in America. 
uh, and that how LBJ used to, so, uh, my fellow Americans, yeah. Uh, so the fact of the matter is the destruction of Israel is the idea of this Islamic revolution in Iran and is one of the pillars of the Iranian Islamic regime. Yeah, it is. Uh, we cannot claim that we have no intention of going to war with Israel. I mean, how many times can you say it? But this is the kind of stuff Hitler was saying before war, and, and Neville Chamberlain didn't take it. Peace in air time. You ever watch that on YouTube? I mean, you talk about the epitome of weakness is Neville Chamberlain stumbling off the airplane holding the paper. I have peace in air time. Uh, sorry, I didn't have a British accent on that, but <laughs> nevertheless, uh, and we're seeing people do the same stupid things today from a biblical perspective in our world today. So we have these prophetic promises that Israel, of course, will survive. Israel will be the head over the nations. Isn't that amazing? Little old Israel. Of course, it's going to expand. Uh, they're, they get upset when you talk about greater Israel today. Boy, when they go all the way up to the Euphrates River, they're going to be really upset at that time. But nevertheless, in Zechariah 14, 1 through 3, in the book of Zechariah, you know, the word means God remembers. He hasn't forgotten. And its focus is on Jerusalem specifically. And here it says, the day of the Lord is coming. I will gather all nations to Jerusalem, this is chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, to fight against it. He, Satan is going to bring them there to destroy the Jews, but God has other plans. Like the master chess player, he lets them come in thinking they're going to do one thing, but he's got bigger plans for them. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as he fights in a day of battle. And this are all the stories in the Old Testament where God delivered the nation of Israel from military threats in amazing ways. And he's going to do the same thing. And here we see the Messiah. Messiah is the one who's going to return to planet Earth. The second coming. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. Then uh, it will split in two from east to the west, and it will be a unique day known only to the Lord. God is going to do that. And it's been 2,000 years since Jesus said he's coming back, right? And we have been praying, why not today, Lord? As Tivia, I think is his name, in Fiddler on the Roof said, wouldn't this be a good time for the Messiah to come? Yes, it would. And that was in the late 1800s before uh, they went through a few hardships as a nation. And he is going to come back. His very presence is going to change history when he uh, does this. And he's going to fulfill literally all those promises to the nation of Israel. And we see in verse 9, it says, the Lord will be king over the whole earth. And on that day, there will be one Lord in his name, the only name. What's going to happen to the multiculturalists or to the universalists and all of this? They're going to be judged for rejecting Jesus as their Messiah because they have no sacrifice for their sins, no payment for their sin. And we see in the New Testament in Revelation 16, 16, uh, where how Satan will be the instrument. He's the left hand of God. The psalmist says God causes the wrath of man to praise him and the remainder of wrath he restrains. God's in control. Then they gathered the kings together to the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. And many of you have been there. You stood on the hill of Megiddo and behind you is the Jezreel Valley where the nations are going to gather. Not going to be a war there at Har Megiddo, but it's going to be the gathering place to attack Jerusalem from. And God will, of course, intervene and rescue his people because they will have become believers by that time at the end of the tribulation. And we see Jesus returning in Revelation 19, 11 through 21. So 
This was Ed's basic message. I'm sure it would have been very different without all the snide remarks that I have added. But we know what the scripture says, and that is that uh, Jesus is going to intervene in history, and he is still the God of Israel. And it's not a good idea to poke God in the eye by opposing his chosen people, even though most of them are in unbelief at this point. And I always like to say, guess what one of the, you know, people say, well, Israel over there, a bunch of unbelievers. I mean, it's like 69% of homosexuals, according to a survey, said that Tel Aviv is their place of destiny for homosexuality. Israel, Tel Aviv. They might have the highest per capita amount of atheists in Israel today. And they're just a bunch of unbelievers over there, right? Well, what is one of the conditions in order to become a believer? You have to be an unbeliever before you can become a believer, right? And so he's bringing them back in unbelief so that they're going to believe. That's what the Bible says, and it's been true thus far, and it's going to be true there. And that's why we see increasingly that God's, I call Israel God's super sign of the end times. And they are back in the land, and they're not going to be kicked out again. Some people say, well, they could be kicked out and back and all this. I'm sorry, it says they're going to return to the land from their global scattering. And so they're there. God is getting ready to do something in history. And I know I come across as kind of kind of dogmatic here, but I'm speaking on the authority of the Word of God. It's, it's certain. It's true. And even though it may take a long time, you know, God is maybe slow, but he's never late. And he will be right on time with what he is trying to accomplish in history. So, at this time, Dr. Reagan is going to come, and we're going to transition into him uh, doing a critique of this four-hour and 20-minute video, I think it is, of uh, called Left Behind or Led Astray. Guess, guess what the video thinks? We're led astray, and it's all this historical stuff about the rapture. And he's going to give a, a, a brief critique. By the way, on the Preacher website, Paul Wilkinson has written a, um, 18, 19 pages of a critique of this. You can go read that on the front. You can access it from the front page of the Preacher website. And uh, also, there's a recent debate that I had on September 25th with a pre-wrath rapture guy. And the video and audio is up now for that. Okay. Oh, here it is. I got it. Okay. Well, I want to begin by uh, wishing uh, all of you a Merry Christmas. And uh, I want to invite you to uh, watch our uh, television program called Christ in Prophecy. Uh, we're broadcasting it now, praise the Lord, on five national Christian networks. And if you can't find it there, you can find it on our website. Uh, lamblion.com, where we archive the programs. And there are many other places on the internet where the programs are archived. Uh, so you can, surely can find it one of those. I'd invite you to start reading our Lamplighter magazine, which comes out every other month, six issues a year. It's free of charge, digital copy. We can send it to you by email. And I want to share with you not a church sign, but one of the funniest signs I've ever seen in my life. The Golden Dragon Chinese Restaurant. And you won't believe what's on this marquee. All you can eat buffet, not mean all day buffet. You know, come stay four hour, you eat, you go home. <laughs> I don't make them up, I just read them. Here's a sign on the back of an 18 wheeler that I really appreciated. Jesus Christ is Lord, not a swear word. And here is, I have two new church signs to share with you. 
Christians, happy Easter. Jews, happy Passover. Atheists, good luck. <laughs> this next one is really snappy. Heaven is real. Hell is hot. Mohammed is dead. Jesus is not. <laughs> And uh, my topic is an attack on the pre-trib rapture. Um, that is the cover of our latest magazine that we'll start distributing January the 1st, The Pre-Tribulation Rapture, A Myth or a Reality. And I'll have a much longer article in there than what I'm going to present to you this morning. Are we ready yet with the audio? I don't know where to look. <laughs> okay. All right, let's pray. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus and thank you so much for every person who's here this morning, for every school and church that's represented. I pray that you will bless us in this uh, conference with uh, insights into your word we've never had before that will draw us into a deeper relationship with you. I pray, Lord, that you will bless our fellowship together. I pray that you will continue to bless the health of Tim LaHaye as he uh, leads this organization and Tommy as well. And uh, we just turn all this over to you right now and pray for the anointing of your Holy Spirit as this is presented in Jesus' name. Amen. In October of this year, a pastor in California issued a video that was titled, Left Behind or Led Astray. The people pictured on the cover are actors in the video who portray from left to right, see Schofield. Margaret MacDonald, John Darby, and Edward Irving. It is a very hard-hitting documentary film that is designed to debunk the concept of a pre-tribulation rapture. The album contains two DVD discs that run a total of four hours and 22 minutes. The presentation is very tedious. It is highly repetitious to the point of quickly becoming downright boring. Originally, they were announced there was only going to be one disc in the set. They added a second one and all it did was repeat what was on the first one. It's very tiresome to say the least and I wanted to shout hallelujah, praise the Lord when it was finally ended in order to make this review. As I said, I had to sit through it three times. The video was produced by Joe Schimmel, the pastor of Blessed Hope Chapel in Simi Valley, California. He also serves as the president of an apologetics ministry called Good Fight Ministries. It is a ministry that actually produced this video. Pastor Schimmel is a premillennials who believes in a post-tribulation rapture. In other words, he believes the rapture and the second coming are all one event that will happen at the end of the tribulation. The purpose of this video documentary is to totally disparage the doctrine of a pre-tribulation rapture. Now, the program begins, interestingly enough, with a very ironic spirit emphasizing that uh, differences in opinion about the nature and timing of the rapture should not divide Christians. And in the process, Pastor Schimmel assures you and me that he loves all of us despite the fact that we have a different viewpoint. Oops, try to go back. Sorry. I want to say at the outset that uh, this isn't something that we should divide fellowship over as Christians because we recognize this is an in-house debate. There are wonderful, beautiful, good Christians on both sides of the issue in this debate. However, it's a very important issue because Jesus gave some of his severest warnings about the timing and the nature of his second coming. As you can see, a very, very ironic beginning. And four hours and 22 minutes later, the video ends with a very ironic ending in which Pastor Schimmel gives Colin Lanuri a huge bear hug. There we go. That's the end of the video. Now, for those of you who may not be familiar with Colin Lanuri, he is the director of the oldest pre-trib rapture ministry in the world, namely the Prophetic Witness Movement International, which was founded in December of 1917 by F.B. Meyer following the Balfour Declaration and the Liberation of Jerusalem. They began to send people out all over the world to preach the soon coming of Jesus. Now, the fundamental problem with this video is that between these ironic bookends, there is an all-out effort 
to besmirch the reputations of every major person that Schimmel considers to have played a role in the development of the pre-trib doctrine. In short, the video is one long, unrelenting, and painful exercise in character assassination. Incidentally, that big bear hug at the end of the video was very deceptive. Colin Lanuri was never told the purpose of the video. He was led to believe that Pastor Schimmel just wanted to interview him about the establishment and history of his ministry. When Co Colin discovered the true purpose of the video, he sent four separate messages, I have copies of them, four separate messages demanding that the footage shot with him not be included in the video. His request was totally ignored. So much for an ironic spirit. Pastor Schimmel begins his review of the history of the development of the pre-trib rapture concept with what he calls a sinister 16th century Spanish priest named Francisco Rivera, who proposed a rapture 45 days before the end of the tribulation. Nothing good, he of course, he points out, could come from such a person, first because he was a Catholic priest, and second because he was a Jesuit. He was followed in the 18th century by a Baptist pastor from Wales by the name of Morgan Edwards, who proposed a rapture in the middle of Daniel's 70th week. This was not a mid-trib mid rapture though, because Morgan considered only the last half of Daniel's 70th week to be the tribulation. But Edwards is immediately written off as having no influence on anyone, and furthermore, he was defrocked for immorality. That brings us to another Jesuit priest, a Latin American named Manuel Lacunza, who wrote in the late 18th century. He also proposed a rapture 45 days before the end of the tribulation. He is dismissed as being very, very devious because he hid his true identity by using a pen name. Pastor Schimmel then tries, uh, ties that priest to Edward Irving whom he describes as a flamboyant and eccentric English prophecy teacher who translated Lacunza's book into English, but who also ends up being defrocked for heresy. To make matters worse, Schimmel spends most of the four hours of the program trying to prove that the real turning point in the development of the pre-trib doctrine came in 1830 when a 15-year-old Scottish girl named Margaret MacDonald got caught up in charismania and began to experience emotional seizures and visions that were demonic in nature. That particular scene you just saw there is repeated over and over and over ad infinitum in this uh, probably at least a dozen times. The concept of a pre-trib rapture was supposed to have emerged from all of these warped people only to be picked up by another Englishman by the name of John Darby who systematized the doctrine and then falsely claimed he had originated. Darby then supposedly became a dogmatic and tyrannical cult leader. When the doctrine spread to the United States, it was popularized by C.I. Schofield in his popular study Bible, the only problem being that Schofield was a drunk, a crook, a jailbird, a shyster, a ruffian, and even other things like a scallywag. <laughs> And then there is Clarence Larkin, the great illustrator of prophetic truths, who turned out to be deeply involved in pyramidology. And if that is not enough to turn your stomach against the pre-trib rapture doctrine, then consider some of the doctrine's modern day proponents. They only mentioned two. Two modern day proponents, Chuck Missler and J.R. Church, both of whom are portrayed as dabblers in astrology. Well, by the time you get to the end of the video, you feel like you've been watching an episode from some slimy modern day TV reality program. You feel like you need to go take a shower. And then there is their treatment of our eminent leader, namely Tommy Ice. He is derisively written off in this video over and over and over again as Tim LaHaye's bulldog. I found that labor label particularly interesting in view of the fact that two of the experts that are featured in this program, the two foremost experts featured in this program are none other than Jacob Prouch and Dave McPherson, both of whom come across as sarcastic, mocking, vilifying pit bulls 
in comparison to Tommy Ice. <laughs> Let me show you what I'm talking about. Here is Jacob Proush talking about John Darby. We have to understand the way other dispensationalists of the era saw Darby. His fellow dispensationalists, they considered him to be a despot, a cult leader. James Grant from the Brethren, George Mueller from Great Britain, the hero of the faith in, in England, Charles Spurgeon. These men were all dispensationalists themselves and outspokenly dispensational in their theology and in their eschatology. They all considered Darby to be a dangerous despot, even taking out full page ads in newspapers, warning against him, telling people to avoid him, saying he was a crazy man who hurt people. Maybe I shouldn't have said put pit bull. Maybe I should have said junk your dog. Okay, here we go with Dave Even McPherson. though uh, a lot of people still don't know very much about Margaret McDonald and Robert Norton and Edward Irving and uh, John Darby, the Christians, conservative Christians, fundamentalists and evangelicals have all heard of the Schofield name, the one who brought out the Schofield Reference Bible, which is still selling, uh, notes in the margin, you know, and people can say, look, I know it's in the Bible, I saw it right there. Uh, his, and he, he got it from James Brooks, and Brooks was influenced by Darby, and you can just trace it all the way back to the, the early guys. And how many people know the hidden side of Schofield's life? Uh, Timothy, Paul told Timothy to know whereof you've been assured of this doctrine. In other words, vet them. We should vet our <laughs> preachers as much as our politicians. Well, Schofield uh, never had any theological training, but he gave himself a DD degree, just to start adding it to his name. Uh, it's in the Schofield Bible in the 1890s. His first wife divorced him because he had deserted her and the two girls. And uh, she divorced him in 1883 uh, at Atchison County, Kansas. He had to soon leave Kansas and flee to Missouri because he had stolen his mother-in-law's life savings. He was obsessed with making money any way he could make it. So in the St. Louis jail for six months forgery conviction, most cr uh, criminals do not rob their own mother-in-law. You don't get it in good with your wife to you do that. Uh, it's just amazing, uh, uh, the hidden side of, of Schofield's life. And uh, people should know about this. By the way, when Schofield was in jail for forgery, for having stolen his mother-in-law's life savings, he was in jail in St. Louis for six months. It, this was after his reported 1879 conversion to Christ. What a man does before is one thing, but afterwards? And there's evidence, too, that Moody, who took him under his wing in Northfield up there in Massachusetts, knew about this and all of his past life. And it, but uh, when he was ordained as a minister down in uh, Dallas, uh, this, uh, this was swept under the rug. Schofield well knew that uh, you're supposed to have a good report of them that are without, the unbelievers. But it's interesting that the papers of the day, whether in St. Louis or uh, Kansas City or Atchison, Kansas or Topeka, Kansas, often referred to Schofield as a rapscallion or a ruffian, uh, as a shyster. The newspapers also called him a scallywag. Well, incidentally, one of the other so-called experts featured in this video is Joel Richardson, the Muslim Antichrist man. Pastor Schimmel blasts the Catholic priests, Manuel Lacunza, for being so devious as to write under an assumed name. I guess he's not aware of the fact that Joel Richardson writes under an assumed name. That is not his real name. But nonetheless, he used him on the program. And just recently, I ran across a news report where Joel Richardson made this comment. I personally do not believe that by the year 2020, that's four years, any credible person will be teaching the secret pre-trib rapture doctrine. I think the events that are coming in the next five years will utterly destroy the doctrine. My first response to that was, what arrogance. But then my second response was, you know, he may be right. 
because the rapture could occur between now and then. And we'd all be gone. <laughs> well, let's get back to the major point. This video from beginning to end is a despicable, unchristlike exercise in character assassination. I found all this mudslinging and character assassination totally irrelevant to the question of the validity of the pre-trib rapture doctrine. After all, the only people God has to work through on this earth, folks, are sinners. I mean, the man who wrote the Psalms was an adulterer and a murderer, and yet he's remembered in God's Word as a man after God's own heart. Take Morgan Edwards, for example. Yes, he was defrocked when he experienced what appeared to be an emotional breakdown and stopped attending church and started drinking. But no mention was made of his many years of faithful service to the church in Wales, Ireland, and here in the United States after he immigrated to this country in 1761, nor was there any mention made of the fact that he co-founded the first Baptist university in the American colonies known as Brown University. And oh, by the way, there is no mention made of the fact that he was completely restored to the church and thereafter lived an exemplary life. And then there are those two Jesuit priests who believed the rapture would occur 45 days before the tribulation and the return of Jesus. Over and over and over we are reminded they were Catholics. They were in the Jesuit order that nothing good could ever come from a Catholic priest. Well, on that basis I guess we'll have to fault the revival of the true gospel by Martin Luther in the 16th century since he was also a Catholic priest. In fact, based on the reasoning of this video presentation, we will have to throw out all of Martin Luther's reforms since he ended up becoming the worst anti-Semite in the history of Christianity. Keep in mind that he wrote a pamphlet near the end of his life in which he provided the, proof, the blueprint for the Holocaust. This was acknowledged by Hitler in his book Mein Kampf when he said, referred to Luther as a great warrior, a true statesman, and a great reformer. Again, the only people God has to work through are people like you and me, sinners. And then there is Margaret MacDonald, the hyper charismatic 15 year old Scottish girl who supposedly affirmed the pre tribulation rapture in her emotional trances in the 1830s, which are portrayed as demon induced. They have an actor portraying her in the video, as I showed you before, and again, it's shown over and over through the tedious four hours. They want you to keep this in your mind as you go away from the film. I grew up in an amillennial church where I never once heard the word rapture. After attending church faithfully for 30 years, if you had asked me to define the rapture, I probably would have said, it's a sensation you feel when your girlfriend kisses you. <laughs> I came to a belief in a pre-tribulation rapture through my study of the Scriptures. And it was years later before I even heard of Margaret MacDonald. Todd Strandberg, the founder of the Rapture Ready website, has written, I cannot recall ever hearing any pre-trib speaker say, I believe in the Rapture because Margaret MacDonald told me so. <laughs> he goes on to say that he searched all the prophecy books in his library written by those with a pre-trib viewpoint, and he could never find even one reference to Margaret MacDonald. He concluded, it was like looking for the cartoon character Waldo. Where's Waldo? Only in this case, no Waldo was ever found. He said, I first heard of, I first heard of Margaret MacDonald when a pre-trib critic told me, he said, you shouldn't be teaching that because the pre-trib rapture doctrine had a false, is false because it originated with a teenage Scottish girl who experienced demonic seizure. I'd been teaching it for years before I heard that. That perked my curiosity. So I went searching for this girl and I found her in a book written by Dave McPherson in 1973 entitled, The Unbelievable Tree Trib Origin. Since that time, McPherson has written at least six subsequent books on the topic, nearly all of which are the same book with just a new title added when he needed a guest to get some new money. As Tommy Ice put it in one of his articles, McPherson has dedicated his life to full-time rapture hating. I will never forget how amazed I was when I finished reading this book. That's because the book had an appendix that contained Margaret MacDonald's prophetic vision. And I could not find even so much as a hint of a pre-trib rapture in what she supposedly said. Here was a whole book dedicated to the proposition that this girl was the originator of a doctrine and not one trace of the doctrine could be found in the vision that he presents as proof. And what is really amazing is that Pastor Schimmel admits this in the video program. 
He says, Our personal position at Good Fight Ministries is that Margaret McDonald's end time rapture vision is convoluted. And we can't say for sure that Margaret McDonald had a partial pre trib rapture in mind. That's after spending the entire video saying it's originated with her, and then he ends up with this. The fact of the matter is that this young woman's vision was about the second coming. And the only novel thing about it was first her unbiblical concept that it would be secret and invisible rather than an event that every eye could see. Another thing is that she said it would consist of a partial rapture of spirit-filled saints, and it would be secret in the sense that it would be seen only by believers. The claim concerning the importance of Mar Margaret MacDonald in the development of the pre-trib rapture, that claim is so silly that it motivated Todd Strandberg to write this. From reading the writings of anti-rapture uh, uh, anti uh, authors, one would think we pre-tribbers would be representing Margaret MacDonald, reverencing Margaret MacDonald as Catholics do Mary. But clearly we don't. Pre-tribbers don't go around reciting, Hail Margaret, full of grace, blessed art thou among visionaries, pray for us sinners at the time of the rapture. <laughs> oh, thank the Lord for Todd. So, the first and most fundamental argument of the whole video is that the pre-trib rapture concept cannot be true because it was developed by people who were theologically unorthodox or morally deficient or mentally unbalanced or all of the above. The second argument presented is that the pre-trib rapture is too new to be true. Dr. Andy Woods has responded decisively to both of those arguments in his series of I think it's 32 articles now. Is that right? Uh, and he, that he's written about the date of the rapture. He's written so many he can't keep up with how many, but he, 32 I believe. His point is that a biblical doctrine is never to be judged by who developed it or when it appeared. Rather, he states, the standard of truth is does the concept harmonize with biblical revelation regardless of the person who originated or the chronological era when the idea arose. There is much, much more I could say about this despicable video, but I promised Tommy Ice I'd keep this brief. The January-February issue of our magazine will contain a more detailed analysis, and Paul Wilkerson has written a detailed rebuttal regarding what the video has to say about John Darby in particular. You can find it on the Pre-Trib website. You can also find the arguments in his book, Understanding Christian Zionism. Let me just conclude by saying, that a remarkable, I mean remarkable, new book has just been published about the historical development of the pre-trib rapture concept. It was written by Dr. William Watson, and its title is Dispensationalism Before Darby. Dr. Watson has used more than 350 primary sources from the 17th and 18th centuries in compiling this new book. He points out that most of the sources that he quotes in the book have not been previously cited in debate about the origin of the pre-trib rapture, most likely because they have not been read in centuries. Concerning the concept of a pre-tribulation rapture, he concludes, very little of what John Darby taught in the mid-19th century was new. His research clearly shows that by the end of the 17th century, the concept of a rapture that is separate and apart from the second coming had become a commonplace concept. He named seven authors who held a pre-conflagration view of the rapture that would take the saints out of the world before the earth was consumed by fire. He identifies six others as clearly pre-trib, and he names four who were not pre-trib but who referred to pre-trib writers. He notes that the use of the word rapture was also widespread with some even referring to those who would be left behind. Sorry Tim, there's nothing new. <laughs> some would be left behind, yes. Okay, this interpretation of a rapture separate and apart from the second coming continued to be espoused by Bible prophecy experts throughout the 18th century. Their timing of the rapture varied, but by the end of the 18th century, more than a generation before Darby, Belief in a rapture of the church before a great tribulation was commonplace in Britain. In fact, Dr. Watson demonstrates that the belief was held not only by Baptists, but also by leading Anglicans and even by Scottish Presbyterians. This book's just come out. I urge you to get a copy of it. Without all of Dr. Watson's detailed evidence, secular historian Paul Boyer had come to the same conclusion in his book, When Time Shall Be No More, subtitled, Prophecy, Belief in Modern American Culture. 
This was published by Harvard University Press in 1994. He wrote, in a sense, Darby's system contained nothing new. His focus on the future fulfillment of prophecy followed the eschatology of early Christians. Premillennialism had been an option for Protestant evangelicals since Joseph Mead's day, while rudimentary forms of dispensationalists go back at least as far as Joachim of Fiore. He continues, even rapture doctrine can be found in the writings of early interpreters including Increase Matha, but Darby wove these diverse strands into a tight and cohesive system that he buttressed at every point by copious biblical proof texts then tirelessly promoted through his writings and his preaching tours. The point is that the concept of a pre-trib rapture did not simply drop from the sky into John Darby's lap in the 1830s. It was a concept that had been slowly developing over several hundred years in the writing of Bible prophecy scholars from a great variety of Christian traditions. And the idea that the concept of a pre-trib rapture originated with a couple of Jesuit priests, that it was reinforced by the ravings of a 15-year-old demon-possessed girl, and that it was put in its final form by a defrocked Presbyterian minister is, to put it mildly, absolutely absurd. And in the process, the scholars who did develop the concept were not developing anything new, rather they were restoring a lost truth, just as did Martin Luther. In fact, at the Diet of Arms in 1521, John Eck, a defender of the Catholic Church, accused Luther of teaching a concept of salvation, quote, that was too new to be true. He said Luther's teachings could not be found in the writings of the Pope or any of the Church Fathers. Luther responded by noting that his doctrines could be found in the writings of a church father who was far more important and significant than John X sources, namely the Apostle Paul, and that is true also of the pre-trib rapture. Thank you.